All right, gonna get set up here. A couple minutes, a couple seconds. Make sure I got all my tabs ready. All that jazz. Okay. Just getting set up. Making sure my uh, making sure the mic is good. Yo, my favorite. Hey, man. Thanks. All right, we're gonna get into it here in a couple seconds. I just gotta make sure my. Oh, you know what? We're just going to wing it. If you got to watch me go through some things, that's fine. All right? Let's go. Going to do some drawing and <clears throat> tell some stories to some destinations. All righty. All right. So, yeah, this is the uh, second day of my uh, stream. Yesterday, I did a test stream. Uh, to my Patreon page, just um, testing this out, um, kind of st still new to this setup. So, but basically what this will be is, um, you know, my, mainly me drawing and making comics live, um, but also it's sort of a stream of thought. Um, so we're going to tell some stories. Um, today, I'm going to tell my uh, Jack Kirby ghost story which I see someone here in the chat is already, yeah, your mama. That's actually the, the Jack Kirby ghost story is sort of the origin of uh, your mama comic, where it came from. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the subject of bitterness from uh, fellow comic artists or the creators, you know, the creative landscape out there. Um, and uh, today's goal is I'm going to ink and color a new page from my uh, uh, my Secret Forces comic. So before I get into that, that's my goal for this um, this uh, stream is to do a little bit of deep work. So um, you know you're going to hear that stream of thought, but also what I'm working on now is standalone comic issues for secret forces i've been giving a lot of the stuff away for free as four panel comics for a while and, and exp experimenting with that <clears throat> but now i'm switching gears back to the comic book format and i'm going to ink color and draw um everything myself right here um you know mostly live um so for other artists it might be helpful and for um <clears throat> you know for people that just want to watch someone draw and talk about fun stories. So let's, let's get into it. So with that being said, let's take a look at what we worked on yesterday. Just a little review. Oh, I'm going to turn off the, uh, <clears throat> turn off the text. So one of the things is, uh, anyways, we, I did, uh, inks and colors on this page yesterday. So this new story is about basically a robot head that flies out of the sky. And, uh, you know, there's some military dudes that are tracking it. Um, today, we're going to be working on the second page, which is Space Force. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as well. So, you know, this is my pencils for um, this page. And as I'm inking it <clears throat> and coloring it, I'll tell some stories. And I'll also kind of dive into uh, whatever the stream of thought is as a creator uh, working on a, a comic page. So, all right, let's, uh, and uh, I will probably look up at some point to see, you know, any kind of comments or questions. Um, and then we can just have a chat. Sound good? Let me see here, change the scroll bar to deep work mode. All right. So 
So let's get into the uh, the actual uh, drawing here. So yeah, this is um, Space Force. Maybe just talk a little bit about um, the inspiration behind this. And I don't know where I put these books. Ah, here they are. So uh, yeah, um, you know, Space Force was around uh, before uh, Donald Trump and the uh, crazy Space Force uh, things on the news. Space Force was actually, um, and I don't know, let me switch my switch my camera view a little bit here. I put this on yesterday's stream for the patrons, but I, I thought I would show, you know, uh, Space Force was actually Sky Masters of the Space Force back in, you know, uh, 1955, 1956. George Adams Syndicate, um, Jack Kirby and Wally Wood. Um, so what a pairing that was. This was like the um, the pinnacle of Jack Kirby's career at the time was getting a syndicated uh, a syndicated comic strip. And Wally Wood was doing the inks on it, which is incredible. Um, so this has been one of my favorite <clears throat> my favorite comics to look at over the time, just for uh, you know the composition and the layout and like the early ones especially. Wally Wood was just uh, you know really trying to be you know, outer, wait, let me see really trying to be some outer space Wally Wood stuff there. So it's pretty cool. Um, yeah, so the cool thing about Sky Masters of the Space Force is it is um, public domain. It means that George Adams Syndicate never did anything with it. It kind of failed as a, it was in the comics uh, for a couple of years. So in my comics, I like to throw in some inspiration and things like that. And in this case, this is kind of a throwaway, um, <clears throat> a throwaway thing, but um, you know, I have Space Force show up occasionally in the comic as a thing, and uh, Sky Masters is still alive. There's no real reasoning for it. It's just, it is what it is. It's just, it's for me. So I'm primarily making comics for myself and uh, for for entertaining myself, and I like to be inspired by that those stories. So in my world, Sky Masters and the Space Force exists, and they've got this star base up there, and this is just a one they're only gonna show up for this like one little throwaway scene. So it's a very much homage show. So <clears throat> my penciling here, I'm gonna get into uh, some drawing. I'll turn around this camera as well. So you're not just staring at my face so you can see the actual setup I'm working on. Let's just adjust it. You know, sooner or later I'll have some fancy camera switchers or something, but for now we're doing it. We're doing it live, so. All right, <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah, so this is basically how a page starts. <clears throat> it's a very um, loose, my penciling is pretty loose. I design these ships on the fly, just, hey, they're triangles and I'll get into the, the ink details to have some fun while, while I'm actually drawing them. And since I'm approaching this page and I approach all of my art when I'm doing it all myself, I don't really have to worry about really tight pencils because we're going to get into the, the inking stage here. So, <clears throat> and I'll probably do what I was doing yesterday. It's just kind of talking out loud to myself um, <laughs> to show you my thinking behind what I'm, what I'm actually drawing here. So, Got my different brushes. Um, I'm going to switch to my regular set. Okay, okay. Go to the inker set. And there's real no no real approach to it. It's just um. Up oh, wrong wrong layer. Notice my eraser brush is not correct from yesterday's coloring. And I, I really don't have a time frame either for these streams. I think um, today, what, what's on my agenda? I have to maybe go to the farmer's market later, 
pick up some stuff for Easter, fresh vegetables and stuff like that. But yay. Um, so I'll just go until I can't go anymore. Um, yeah. So let me tell a ghost story real quick. And I was thinking about this this morning because as I was preparing and doing a couple chores, I uh, I was listening to Shaky Graves, his new uh, his new old album, and he's a really great storyteller. <clears throat> you know, he said said in the past that he got his name like whatever hanging out in a graveyard. That's how he learned how to play, you know, guitar and all this crap. So. Um, and then ghosts and spirits like helped him create. I always thought that that was kind of neat and it resonates with me for a lot of reasons, but um, yeah, so probably 1999 or so I um, um, had a dream about I had a dream and uh, let me just switch the camera because I just want I want to say this uh, say this live go back to this too close all right yeah so probably in 1998 or so I had a dream about uh, Jack Kirby coming to me in a dream and it was everything was white and uh, that's what I remember most. And there was like a Mexican radio playing in the background. Now I had just come back a few years earlier from living in California. So, and uh, working in Coachella. And so I think that was just kind of like, I'm always trying to figure out what's going on in my dreams. Right. And um, in the dream, like Jack Kirby was really belligerent. And at the time in my life too, I wasn't really like a Jack Kirby fan. I was more like, you know, pop, culture, uh, pop, whatever was going on in uh, comics. And um, yeah, so I had this dream and it was really like just bizarre. But anyways, in the dream, Jack Kirby was really belligerent and mean. And I was being lazy, I guess. And he was kicking me up and like kind of pushing me towards the desk and telling me I needed to go and draw these comics. And um I was like, this is a, this is bizarre. I've never really, I've only known Jack Kirby comics from like, you know, the, ah, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, the, the classic whatever. And uh, a few years before that, I got to see Jack Kirby at a comic con, San Diego comic con, um, probably 93 or 92. Um, and I didn't respect it then either. I was pretty young and I was like, oh, here's this old guy. He's pretty famous. I'm going to show, show him some artwork or whatever. And looking back, man, what a waste, you know, what a stupid, stupid time that, that was because my mind was somewhere else, you know, and, and becoming like image comics or something, get breaking into like the, uh, <clears throat> the bigger comic game. So anyways, I had this dream. Jack Kirby was really belligerent and telling me <clears throat> I needed to go and make these comics. And uh, then I went to... Um, it just, I, I drew a little cartoon about it, about the ghost of Jack Kirby, like swearing at me and stuff. And it showed my friends and they were like, this is hilarious. You need to make this into a comic. But I went to uh, mid Ohio con that year and, um, I sat in on a, uh, I saw that there was a, a, a panel about Jack Kirby and his, um, assistant Mark Venier and, um, Sergio Aragonis was on the panel. They did this panel every year at Mid Ohio Con, and I always kind of skipped it. But this year, I had had this weird Jack Kirby dream, so I thought, okay, um, I'm going to sit in and just listen, you know, to what they have to say. And the thing that shook me was, and again, I didn't know anything really about the history of comics at the time. I was a young, kind of like young punk or something, you know. And um, they said something like. Uh, Jack used to draw and play like a Mexican radio for noise in the background. He didn't even really know what it was saying, but he needed some sort of noise playing. And when they said that, I was like, holy crap, that was a Mexican radio in my dream. And so, you know, the young impressionable DJ was like, 
I need to, I got to do something with this. So I, you know, at the time I just drew, I was pretty like a, you know, full of piss and vinegar, young guy. And I decided to um, make a little mini comic and I called it your mama. And it was the truth about comics. Cause, and it was the spirit of that ghost. It was a story. It was that story. It was Jack Kirby coming to a young man and saying, you're going to, you're going to take over and you got to fix this comic book industry. And Stanley is awful. And these people are ruining the shit that I created. And like, uh, so that's what the mini comic was about. And it was just like a pretty uh, jaded and uh, uh, very dark, <laughs> dark humor. And uh, it has a little cult following um, to this day. Uh, it, it evolved into a web comic and whatnot, but, but that was my, uh, that was the, um, Jack Kirby coming to me in a dream story. And then, you know, then I, I, like that year or two years later, there was a freaking, I might've told this story at some conventions or something, uh, only to like close friends. Cause I didn't want people to think I was crazy or that it was real. Um, but uh, yeah, I would only say it to, to close friends, but the comic was actually based on these real events. Um, for instance, one of the Your Mama comics, um, my friend Bob and I drive to New Dimension Comics, but in the comic it's called No Dimension Comics, which I'm really good friends with these guys now. But um, <laughs> we tried in real life. I took these mini comics around and I went to the owner and I, I went in. I drove an hour and a half. This is before the Internet, too. Like this is like kind of before the Internet, like 1998. Like people just weren't all on the Internet. Um and uh, we went to, um, we went in and I said, hey man, will you carry these? I'll just, you know, you don't have to pay for them or whatever. If they sell, they sell. And um, uh, I think I might have some your mama stuff in here. That's why I wanted to check. Oh yeah, there's some your mama in here. Um, and uh, <laughs> the owner was like, no, I'm not carrying this stuff. This is, I don't carry stuff like this, right? And it was just, the, I, must, I must have caught him on a bad day because it was Todd McDevitt. He, he's the owner, now a good friend and founder of like Three Rivers Comic Con. And, um, and I was like, fuck this guy. So uh, the next issue was us like calling it No Dimension Comics and, and actually drawing that experience. So it was kind of autobiographical in a way. And uh, Bob's peeing on all the back issues in his store and um, cut to, you know, before I left that store that day, I gave him some and I was like, hey, man, just read it whenever you're on the toilet or whatever. And, and if you get to it, whatever. And then like months later, he actually messaged and said, um, or no, he didn't message. This, this was a letter in the mail that I have somewhere. I have the actual letter. Hey, I finally got around to reading your comics. I want all the new issues. Would you bring them up? Uh, da, da, da. And I'm like, oh, you know, no, you don't want to see the new issues because we're making fun of your comic store, you know? So hilarious. I told, I think I told this story to, to, to Todd over the years, uh, over some beers, but that was hilarious. So there was definitely a delay in the, the thing that would happen back then. You know, months later, you might get a fan letter in the mail or somebody actually asking for uh, comics. So uh, <laughs> needless to say, that kicked off my... Uh, kind of my comic uh, journey, you know, with uh, uh, your mama, the, the feel of this jaded, uh, you know, bitterness, I guess, um, which kind of leads to the next, like, uh, there was, it was kind of a fake bitterness because obviously, you know, as a young guy trying to break into comics, having experiences like that suck. Um, and then the people turn around and when you actually communicate, cool, awesome dudes. So, it's a funny, it's a funny history story for me, but that's my Jack Kirby ghost story. That's where your mama comes from. If you've seen your mama around, you know, uh, that's where that comes from. Uh, as you grow up and become more, less bitter about things, um, in life, I think that, um, yeah, you just kind of change your, uh, change your mindset a bit. So your mama doesn't really resonate with me. I, I fooled around with it a little bit and made fun of things in comics and, but it was always really tongue in cheek. It was never really s supposed to be hurtful. 
or mean or, or you know i never really meant to hurt anybody's feelings or anything like that and i did i, I hurt a lot of feelings so um you know i used to be mad with people that called comic books pamphlets and uh i think we drew like a the characters we have a brick of silence and they're smashing a character saying like ah pamphlets like it's to silence the person and years later 10 years later i found out that the husband the husband of this lady said that yeah you guys once drew your characters hitting my wife with a brick and i was like oh man no like i, I didn't mean it so yeah it just it just started to not feel right to do those that type of satire and like I, I wasn't i wasn't aware that it was really hurting people's feelings and that was not the point of comics for me um you know entertaining yourself but you might be kind of hurting someone else so um you know don't want to do that uh, and that kind of leads to my next thing. And I'm going to jump in here and actually ink because I've been talking now for 20 minutes or so. Um, there's Rich says he loves your mama. Yeah, he's been in your mama. Rich, you've been in your mama. See how that works. You've been in your mama for quite some time. Uh, <clears throat> that kind of leads to my next um, talking point for the day was letting go of bitterness right and this comes from like um i was watching the uh the new invincible cartoon and i really was into it because number one i i know i know of those guys or i know those guys uh you know we kind of came up all around the same time in comics um <clears throat> ryan otney Ryan Otley. I mean, um, I know a Ryan Otney and a Ryan Otley, so it's a little bit. Mm. But Uncle Waya is the guy that drew uh, Invincible for Robert Kirkman. And every time something big hits, so rewind a little bit, Brian Bendis. Uh, you know, Bendis came up around those same times I was just talking about. Um, mid Ohio con. He was from Cleveland. He had a thing called boom, boom studios. And, uh, you know, jinx and all the independent comics. He put on oh, this line wrong. All the independent comics that he put out were really, Oh geez. Mess it up. All the independent comics that Bendis put out were very, uh, inspirational to a lot of indie comics guys here around Pittsburgh too. So we used to travel to all the shows and collect all the Bendis books. So like, you know, watching his career explode over the years has just been really like, honestly, a joy, right? Like, that's how I see it. I see like coming up in comics is hard enough. Making comics is hard enough. But um, real success in comics is fleeting. So anytime for me, you know, anytime I'm going to merge these layers here. Are we good? Yeah. Um, anytime I see success in comics like that, and especially if I kind of know the guy, like I know Brian Bendis and uh, he put the work in and I just, I love it. Now when I see Miles Morales, anything, I just get this like smile inside. Like I'm super happy when I see my friends doing well. Uh, even not as famous friends, but like, uh, you know, a good friend in comics is doing something cool. And I'm like, this is awesome. You know, like, good. That's, I just feel like a real genuine uh, feeling of warmth and joy, to be honest. And um, so <laughs> cut to uh, last week watching the Invincible show on Amazon. And I was like, wow, this is crazy like so number my first thought was okay this is going to be really good for artists because the posing and whatnot in the show the action shots it's like a master course in uh life drawing and simplified forms and if you pause any of those action scenes you're going to get so many poses to look at and reference and no i don't say like you know i don't say like trace them but what a 
what a cool benefit. And the, I follow the guy. I can't think of his name off the top of my head. He's the uh, the director from uh, DreamWorks Animation that was, um, you know, working on some of the basic concepts and stuff for the action on that show. And super cool. And I also thought Laura Ines, uh, she's from originally from Pittsburgh. She had something to do with the show too. I think she worked for Skybound. So it's like, it's really like comics is a really small, close knit community. That's what's up. Like that's just how it always is. So uh, I'm excited about the invincible show. And I jumped to Facebook, which is probably the worst place to go for anything, right? And the, I, I thought, I mean, I'm going to see posts that are people are excited about this. I'm going to come, I'm a day late or something. I want to see what other people are saying. Stupid idea. And um, I saw so much bitterness. And people like, oh, Kirkman, wow, wow. You know, and people saying like, you know, one post was like, I should want to like this, but I'm not going to watch this. And, you know, I just felt, then it just made me feel bad. So going on social media just made me feel bad. After I was excited about a thing, I go online to see what, you know, my friends and colleagues are saying, and they're like, you know, junking it up. And then I felt bad about it. But it was like, no, no, I still like it, right? But I thought to myself, well, that's bitterness. And that's, that is even though the person was like, oh, I'm not jealous of Kirkman or anything. I'm just saying that stuff's super violent and wow. And it just seemed like bitter, bitter medicine. You know what I mean? Like bitter fruit or whatever that the guy was jiving with. And I, and I wanted to say, hey, and I didn't because I don't want to get involved. But that, that kind of feeling doesn't serve you. Um, to really like attack something that in a small world like comics do you can not like something for sure but to like actively post about it and engage a big conversation about how something sucked or how something that you thought was ultra violent or you know what's a really it's hurting the thing you know and it's making you look like you're kind of a jerk too and people aren't going to want to work with you and this person's around comics people aren't going to want to work with you when you have that vibe that's just how it is and they're also not going to want to be you know, people can feel it um publishers can feel it colleagues can feel it like you you deserve that you should have been that show or that thing right what well, i don't know what the word is for that but people can feel that sh shit on you and it's not a good it's not a good look so i would say you need to get your head right when you're creating things because that's a novel idea instead of being mad about someone else's success why don't you go make something instead of sitting around talking about it or grumbling and mumbling and saying how bad your life is or what kind of sob stories you have. I think that, you know, um, let's see, this camera's kind of, it's better. Um, anyways, that's just the stream of thought, right? I was thinking about that a lot this week and, uh, And it is a small world in comics, man, and everything, really. And my German colleagues uh, at my day job, actually my old boss, he told me once when we were sad that people were leaving the company, he said, ah, in Germany, we have a saying that you always meet twice. And that stuck with me too. Like, because doesn't that seem true? <laughs> that you do always kind of meet twice in some way or fashion. So you got to be careful how you interact. I've learned that myself just from, like I said, being uh, drawn bad comics online and, you know, some things I regret uh, making. 
some choices I do regret. Or that I just changed over time. But now, you know, I'm way different person. So people that maybe even knew me when I was 19, you know, well, I'm 45 now. I've seen a lot of shit and uh, done a lot of things and learned a lot of lessons. And then there's people that are like, 45, you're a young fart, you know. And I talk to those guys a lot. Um, <laughs> so when I'm like, hey, man, I know a lot of stuff. They're like, you don't know shit. You're just 45. So think about that sometimes. And then some of those guys that I just talked about, you know, they're pretty bitter dudes. We're just going to keep the conversation flowing around the train of thought here about Jack Kirby and um, Sky Masters of the Space Force. This is where my head is, right? Thinking about all this stuff as I'm drawing this. As I'm drawing, I'm drawing a space station here. It's a star, star base. It's very, you know, very cliche, but on purpose. Right? It's supposed to be fun. It's not supposed to be overthought. Anyways, that's interesting that back in that time, Jack Kirby thought that that was the pinnacle of his career. He finally made it after years and years. This is 1950-something. He had already done Captain America, you know, for Timely Comics. He had done tons of romance comics. He had his own comic line. And uh, romance, yeah, tons. But he never quite made it in his mind or whatever, or even, you know, um, financially. Until he got this syndicate gig with George Adams Syndicate and Sky Masters. And uh, he gloated to all his friends. He went out and bought a brand new suit. Jack Kirby did. There's pictures of him online wearing the suit. He went down to the little park and he had a cane or something, looking like a pimp. And was like, ha, 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 I'm making the big money now, guys, you know. And, uh, and it was a cool gig. He did get paid more than he ever made ever before to that point. And uh, the syndicate just kind of went under. There was some falling out with that scene. There was a lot of competition in the daily comic strip uh, area. Um, and Sky Masters kind of fell off. The quality went down. Um, it didn't really hit. Just it was before it was before its time, really, because like the outer space stuff was still very science fiction at the time. And people were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. They wanted Terry and the Pirates. And they wanted, like, real-life, you know, um, swashbuckling adventure Prince Valiant stuff. So it just didn't last. But, you know, there's probably a point where, at that, I don't know what age he was, 1950-something, 1955, 56. He was definitely before age 44. Um but Jack Kirby wasn't only 44 years old when he created the Fantastic Four, right? Based partially out of uh, Challengers of the Unknown. 44, he, like that's crazy. So he was 44 years old and he made something. And the story goes that Stan Lee was crying and they were shutting the Marvel offices this is a classic story you can read up on if you don't believe me. They were going to close it because the sales were down. Everything sucked. And uh, they were actually carrying chairs out of the Marvel offices. Okay. And um, Jack Kirby showed up. What the hell's going on, guys? And uh, no, 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 no. Give me the weekend. Don't shut things down. I'll come up with something. And he went over the weekend and drew the Fantastic Four from certain stories I've heard the whole entire issue. He just brought it in and handed the whole issue to them and said, do this. You want this other thing. You guys need to compete against superheroes. 
Here's the Fantastic Four for you. And that was it. And that kind of dawned the Marvel age of comics. And I don't want to get into all that because, you know, but yeah. If it weren't for Jack Kirby at age 44, after he had already failed at, you know, his pinnacle or whatever, um, we might not have Invincible or all the all the Marvel movies and comics. And, and he always knew. He always knew. Every time you talk to Jack Kirby in those interviews and stuff, he would say, Comics are gonna comics are the shit, man. He wouldn't say that. That wasn't a Jack Kirby quote. Not a not a real Jack Kirby quote. Comics are the shit, man. But he was thinking it. He knew it. And he was right. And he was always ahead of his time, which is cool. Cool as shit. Hey man. The star base is looking pretty good. All right. But yeah, cut to the guy on the internet. Wah, I don't like this thing. It's too violent. <sighs> Just shut up and make comics. You know, that's what you got to do. And if something didn't go right, suck it up. That's what I used to tell my kids too. When they were, oh, dad, my leg hurts. Or I'm gonna... Suck it up. Come on. You're going to be all right. Things are going to be okay. You don't need to tear other people down uh, to do that. Boy, these streams go pretty fast. I could, I could really, uh, I was talking about it yesterday with the Patreon crew. And uh, I did it four hours yesterday, and it just went by super fast. I got a whole page uh, colored and inked. And um, it went by really fast. But I'm thinking, no one's going to watch four hours of me doing this. But you can jump in and out. And I thought maybe by adding, if you want to hear me tell a story or my point of view on something, um, maybe... Maybe you want to hear a ghost story about Jack Kirby or you want to hear about me noodling way too much on this space station. That's never going to appear again, probably. Um, okay. Okay. And again, what I was, I was describing this yesterday, but whenever I'm uh, trying to, um, Oh, look, here, uh, my son's in the feed here. When I said suck it up, Kaufman, uh, he said he can confirm that I used to say that. I now tell my wife uh, when she's having a headache or something, I'm like, you know, I used to tell my kids just to suck it up. Suck it up, Kaufman. And that was kind of the mantra. Yeah. Sorry, kids. I probably could have you know, been a little more, you know, oh, let me give you a hug or, <laughs> but that's not what my dad taught me. My dad said, yeah, come on, do the thing. Just take out that garbage or go to the dentist. Stop being a big baby. <laughs> oh. Oh, yeah. So anyways, like I was saying yesterday on the stream yesterday, I have been drawing in black and white for the past year. So I'm trying now that I know I'm going to color this page, I'm not going to put too many black and white because my 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 brain wants to kind of do a lot of this stuff, you know, but um, let's switch this camera around. Here. A little more. Okay. Um, 
but I need to stop that because that doesn't really serve the, what if I'm coloring this page and I know what I want this to be, a, the blue planet Earth with some atmosphere and stuff like I did on the previous page. And then this is all going to be some purple, you know, this area here. Oh, this area here will all be like purple and blue. And, um, you know, so the only thing that's really important are these little floaty satellite things, docks or whatever they are. And I don't even have to really worry about it. That's another thing, like, I don't know. When you look at outer space, you don't know what the hell things are that are floating around beside a space station. You just go, yeah, that looks like that's right. There's a little blinky light thing. Let's put another blinky light here. And then I can actually make it glow, right? One more little satellite. And speaking of ghost stories, this morning, the thing that made me think about ghost stories and Jack Kirby's ghost and all that was I was listening to Shaky Graves and his new album. It's a 10-year album for his Roll the Bones. And I opened up the box and I was looking at his little booklet and having some coffee and listening to some tunes and reading. And in there, he mentions that... <laughs> He got a haunted guitar in the storyline. The story that he told was just pretty cool that his friend said, Hey, I got this guitar. You, you should have it. It was owned by this guy named like Jay Manley. And he was a world war two vet that messed up his fingers really bad or something. And, uh, cause burnt, burned his hands up rescuing people when he went to uh, world war two. He saw like a lot of action on the beaches and stuff, and he saved like 37 guys or something. And there's newspaper clippings. And so when he came back, he couldn't play the guitar really well, and he had to break the cartilage in his hands um, to play every time. And so the story goes that this guitar was haunted. <laughs> and uh, he's like, So I think you should play it. And he was like, What? <laughs> And uh, he says that in the in the actual album, I think you can listen to this on Spotify. He, he says that he went to tune it, and this guitar did not want to be played by him, and he and the tuning was weird, and um, so he decided, uh, okay, f it. He started talking to the spirit the ghost or whatever and said, okay, I'll, I'll stop trying to do what I'm trying to do on your guitar. Let's just see what, what you want to do. And then he tuned it to, <clears throat> he tuned it to itself. And then the thing started spitting out melodies. So his most famous songs, he says, were given to him by a ghost. <laughs> and when I think of that, I think of that Jack Kirby dream and the, the weird thing. So those kind of stories resonate with me. Ghost stories. And comics is weird too. Like, I was trying to tell someone else, like, outside of comics, nobody knows these names. You might know Robert Kirkman's name because of The Walking Dead. You might. But people don't know Brian Bendis' name. Sorry, Brian. And But inside comics, if, if you drop those names, you know, that, that means something. That you know those people or that you, oh, yeah. Bob Kirkman. And um, Robert Kirkman, he's got a hell of a story, man. Same thing, really. Kind of fake it till you make it <laughs> sort of story. Like, good, good dude. As a matter of fact, I. Uh, I have a Bob Kirkman story, a Robert Kirkman story. 
when I was drawing the Monkey Man Unleashed comic for Brian Lynch, I thought this is a of course this is gonna get in Diamond comic distribution. But we got turned down. And, and that was connected in a weird way to View Askew and Kevin Smith. And you know, Brian Lynch was kind of on the outskirts there. He wrote Big Helium, Big Helium Dog, and it's a real, you know, real, you know, underground. That's an underground movie scene, I guess you'd say. I don't know how to describe you as goo back then. You either knew about it or you didn't. And uh, I was always geeked out to work with those dudes. And I thought everybody knows what Jane and Silent Bob's secret stash is. And oh, the idiot from Diamond, Steve Leaf. I'm just going to say his name. I'm going to say it. Fuck you, Steve Leaf. Uh Steve Leaf said, oh, this is a black and white comic. We can't take black and white. I don't, I don't like to put black and white comics in my portfolio that I bring into. To, and at the time, you would get a rep, probably still to this day, you would get a rep at Diamond based on your alphabetical order. So I don't know why we had Steve Leaf. I think it had to do with Brian's last name or my last name or maybe Angry Naked Comics or I don't know. He had the A's. <laughs> yeah, so Steve Leaf turned it down. And I think even Brian was kind of like, what? That was weird. So Secret Stash put it out. They said, forget it, guys. Just go ahead and publish it. So Brian published it. And uh, Secret Stash put it up on their website. I think like a Yahoo checkout or something like that. You know, we had the guys that everybody knows now, like Ming and all those dudes. Like Ming was basically the web, the web dude for ViewSQ, the web developer so he'd give me ftp access for things and <laughs> we would upload files and like you know uh we had scott Mosier. uh that's that's kevin smith's right hand man he did the back cover for monkey man and Lee. so i don't know i just had a good time working on that stuff because i knew those names and i i was like super geeked out in my mind like holy shit we got a scott Mosier cover and like no one knew what that meant <laughs> It still doesn't mean anything, really. But to me, I was like, I still smile about it because those guys were a big, big influence on me and my humor. Just drive, I guess. And uh, <laughs> anyway, Steve Leaf. And that was a bummer. And so we're at Pittsburgh Com I'm at Pittsburgh Comic Con and I go up to um, Robert Kirkman and he either kind of maybe familiar with me, like knew me from the comics. Um, it, uh, you know, oh, I see this guy when I'm coming here. That's kind of the familiarity. Like, So he was always very friendly. He met a lot of people. And he still wasn't famous at the time. They had the Funkatron comics out, Battle Pope. But he had just gotten his kind of break with hmm, Eric Larson and Image Comics. And... Um, I, he was asking me like excitedly almost like, oh, what's going on, man? Like, that's how Robert Kirkman was kind of like a faux hillbilly. So like, what's going on, man? What you working on now? What's, what's going on these days? And we had the monkey man table there with bananas and fooling around, goofing around. And I said, yeah, man, we're working on this thing. And he's like, that's cool. That's actually a pretty good Kirkman that I'm doing right now. That's cool, man. What? Where can I get that? And I told him the diamond story, and he was like, "What? They didn't accept it, don't they know?" And I'm like, "No." Uh, he goes, well, "Why?" And I'm like, "I don't know. I think it's just black and white comics." And I said, "Steve Leaf," and he kind of was like, "No, no." Mm -mm. Talk to this guy, and he wrote down Philip Philip Sab Sablik's uh, email address and said, "You got to talk to my guy, Diamond. He'll get it in. Just tell him that Robert said." do this and tell them that it's, you know, tell them what it's connected and rewind a minute to the, to Steve Leaf. Steve, if you're out there still, you're kind of a jerk, but and you made a mistake. It's okay. Um, when I told Steve Leaf and I didn't want to say like, I never want to name drop those people. Like, Hey, this is a book that's kind of connected to this thing that, you know, is view askew and Kevin Smith, you know, view askew, Kevin Smith. 
And at the time, Kevin Smith was doing like some Marvel books or like being really late on scripts. <laughs> but everybody loved Kevin Smith in the comic books. I wanted to see him do more. So Steve Leaf tells me he'll put the comic in Diamond if we get a forward or some kind of backup story from Kevin Smith. And I was like, fuck you. I don't think I ever told Brian Lynch that either. Maybe I did. But I was like, no, we're not, we're not doing that. This is Brian's comic. And yeah, it is. They are, they are all friends, but we don't do that. And so there you go. Steve Leaf said, no, unless you have Kevin Smith actually attached to it, he didn't believe it or something. So weird. Weird, weird, weird. And those guys are gatekeepers at Diamond at the time. Maybe not so much anymore. And if you didn't get in Diamond, you were pretty much not existing in the comic book world. You know, comic shops couldn't get your book. So, yeah, suck. Because it was black and white and because we didn't get a quote from no, Kevin Smith. But thanks to Robert Kirkman, we actually ended up getting in Diamond after we had already solicited online. And let me tell you, that's another thing that you don't know. And I don't know if it, I don't know how it is today. I think Diamond's about to die. Rest in peace, Diamond. Um, but uh, if you had already solicited online, Diamond had a rule saying like, nope, if you've already sold this somewhere, we can't, we have to be exclusive to Diamond. Right. But in this case, they made a special, you know, Philip got it done. And that was because of Robert. So and I thanked him years later. And, you know, every time I see him at shows, mm, this is probably how you can identify me, Kirkman, if you're ever listening to this report. I'll yell, Funkatron! Because <laughs> that was the name of his publisher at the time. And he'll laugh and go, ah, that's that guy. Right. So that's the extent that I know Robert Kirkman uh, right now. <laughs> I'm the guy that yells Funkatron at him, and I own all the old Funkatron comic books. And I appreciate those memories. Um, am I pulling a life out right now? I'm like, I'm going to cut off these feet. And these legs look really long. Hey, don't worry about it. Don't worry about whatever I'm doing here. This is fine. This is going to be super small on the page, too, by the way. Like, the full page is looking like that. Okay. So, yeah, um, those are my... <laughs> that's my Robert Kirkman stories. Um, and I like to think about that because I know the hustle. Uh, that guy had so much on his credit cards and was barely getting by and... Then he finally got some sort of success, right? And when you cut that to like now, looking at how cool, there's a lot of a lot of failures that too. I'm sure, I'm sure he would tell you. Um, but to go on Facebook and Pete and see, you know, people that I actually, you know, I was like, oh, this, I like this guy, I like this creator, and I see them shitting on. Kirkman. I'm like, did you have a bad experience with that guy? Because oh, I can't imagine. He always seemed super supportive of all indie comics. And even my wife and I were talking about that the other day. I remembered, um, you know, he put out a call a long time ago and it was kind of controversial for comics. Maybe I don't know, but he said, don't work for Marvel and DC. Go create your own stuff. And I loved it. I was like, yeah, man. Yeah. Yeah. Down with the corporate giant. Right. No, he wasn't like that. He was just like, you know, you're you're the only one that can is gonna really care about your own thing. Right. It's still up somewhere. There's a video, like a manifesto. I think they called it like his and that was before he was the publisher of Image Comics. Uh but he stuck with it. So he put, he, 
He ate his own dog food, as they say in the marketing world. He decided, I'm going to put out Walking Dead. I'm going to put out these uh, the robot suit one. I forget what the name of that one was called. That was a cool, I thought that was a cool concept too. So he just threw a bunch of his ideas out and got a publisher underneath Image, which probably helped him a lot. And, and a lot of those books didn't make it, but Walking Dead hit. And that was cool. And obviously there's a lot of writers that are like bitter about the success. And I just don't get it. It makes me super happy whenever anyone from comics comes up. No, I think that's the good, the, the right mindset that you should have if you're making comics. If you're listening to this, <laughs> so yeah, I'll talk a little bit about this page, maybe. So uh, previous page. Let's get into that real quick. I don't want to give away too much of the story because if you want to see it when it's out, whatever. No one's going to pay attention to this. But a uh, mysterious item is falling from the sky. And it's a robot head. You know, we can clearly see that. But these guys at the military cannot. And they're like, and this is this is Hawk Mountain listening post in Pennsylvania. And I only picked it because it's a cool sounding name, Hawk Mountain. Okay. And they're like, the text is here underneath this, but I'm not going to show it. Um, basically, like, oh, we got a, we got a one, we got a one nine six five, 1965, and uh, something happened in 1965 in the Secret Forces universe. So if you're a fan of the comic or whatever, uh, they know. Um, but it's above their pay grade, so they call Space Force to say, "Yo." We got a night. We got a code one nine six five here. What is this one of yours? And they're like, they're like, uh oh, we don't know what that is either. But we're supposed to check it out. Who wants to come with me? So the main sky guy here, Sky Masters, this Major Masters is gonna fly out, and so they're cruising down to check it out. That's kind of what's going on on this page. And this panel. Um, just some throwaway characters, you know. But I am kind of basing the suits a little bit on the suits from the old comic strip. So. And that's kind of always a challenging foot to draw. The back, these legs are a little long too, to be honest with you. So this is me actually when I'm thinking while I'm drawing. I'm just going to talk out loud as I'm drawing. You know, I think these legs. I think these legs are wonky, but I'm not going to fix them right now. I'm just going to try and make them work because they're so small on the page. And one of the tricks of comics is, I mean, when something's this small, if an inker were inking it, this. Let me see on the screen here what are you guys looking at. If an inker were inking it this big, uh, you wouldn't notice. But since I'm drawing on a magical iPad screen, I, I have the ability to, to go into all, just right into the pixels, which is insane. So you got to be careful when you're drawing digitally to like not over noodle it. You know, noodling is what they say, what they call it. As a matter of fact, you know, I was studying a lot of Alex Toth recently, and um, I was pretty inspired by the silhouette shape. So, you know, that's what we're gonna do with this girl's butt here. We're just gonna fill in some black areas, the shape and the light, and we'll hit that up with some color, and it's gonna look great. You know, cause this is like a computer screen like a hologram sort of thing. And I figure that there's like these like cool Kirby-esque just disc connectors for when they put their spacesuit on their like casual suits. 
that's kind of what I'm going with storyline when I'm drawing. Like, I feel like when you're drawing, you should have a reason for, okay, what are these discs on their back here? That's if they have to like strap on them. Um, strap on a suit. There you go. And then the suits inside the Sky Masters comic had this like padding strip thing going down the edges. So that's what makes it look like a. I don't even know what this is looking like on the stream screen. It's kind of hard for me to see both screens. Okay. Pointy, pointy elbow. We're going to make most of this black. And I believe their suits in the book were kind of like a crimson red. Kind of like the red leather from uh, Guardians of the Galaxy guy, uh, Star-Lord, the red leather jacket that he wears. That's what I was thinking whenever I saw that movie. I was like, that kind of looks like the color of how Space Force's uniforms would look. I'll do a better job too of um, scheduling these posts. Um, I'm going to do a regular regular weeknight. I haven't picked the time yet, so and I might not do a full page. You know, full uh, four hours of streaming. I might just do um, like focus on one panel instead of all the talking. I don't even really know what's more interesting for people to to watch. You can tell me. If you'd rather just watch me draw, I can shut up. I can put headphones in and listen to some music. But when I was thinking of doing a stream, I was like, I don't want to just do that. I don't want to just be like, oh, I'm going to work on this girl's face, and this pinup. Here you go. Watch me draw this fan art. I. I thought when I watch streams, I don't hear enough artists thinking, and maybe it's because they're afraid to say what's in their mind at the time when they're drawing, or they're afraid, maybe a little bit of like, oh, I'm not drawing this right, I look like a phony. That's what a lot of artists think when they're drawing, but, or they're editing it, you know, they're editing themselves quite a bit for whatever reason. And I thought, I can't do that. I gotta just tell you what's in my brain as I'm working. Okay, okay. Let's change this up to Okay. I also encounter people that are like, we didn't even know you were drawing a comic. And um, I don't really promote myself too much. And I'm not really selling much. So I don't, it's not really why I'm doing it, but I'm 
now with the stream, you know, you'll probably see me doing a little bit more of that, but. It might also be fun to have some people on and talk to each other live. I can do that in this app too. Um, have other creator friends of mine on and chat about a topic or something as we draw. That could be that could be fun. I haven't approached anybody about it because I want to. My main goal, my main goal with this feed is to um oh man my hand is really shaky there all right let's do a different angle here no okay i don't like that i'm gonna go ahead and just do a circle that's better Yeah, my main goal here is to uh, actually start getting some work done live. And um, I won't do all of it live. I think we looked at one page yesterday, and it's about eight hours a page. Fully written, inked, colored, and uh, messed around with. This app will uh, time my work too so it kind of keeps you honest if i see that um like let's see let's just do a real quick check i'm curious canvas information statistics i have four hours and eight minutes in this page so far and probably a lot of that was the writing that you can't see but it's in a it's in a it's in some text files there um because i'll go in and change like what the characters are saying i don't since i'm doing this myself I don't really have a script. Um, it's I write the I, I have the plot, and then I do it old school style. Since I'm the writer and the full creator, I can kind of go. You know what? I think my maybe I change this part of this uh, of what they're saying, or something might excite me while I'm like, oh, this is a better idea while I'm actually inking or doing the deep work. So, yeah. Oh, thanks, Rich. I usually always have something to say, but I think that's what the point of sharing deep, deep work or like thinking would be like, sometimes your mind is wondering when you're getting in that zone and I'm thinking about different topics. Some of them I might not want to talk about, but some of them are stories like that. Like, I just don't understand the bitterness <clears throat> of some people hating, you know, don't be a player hater. And my, uh, my coworkers and my friends a few small circle that I have, they'll hear a crazy story from me and they'll be like, oh, man, that's, a, you should tell that. And I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. They say, you get the best stories. And I'm like, well, maybe I tell them on a stream or something. I don't know if they're helpful or not, but today's lesson is definitely let go of bitterness in your life. This doesn't serve you. It doesn't serve your creativity or your feelings. People will think you're an asshole. So don't, <laughs> don't be bitter. Yeah. Again, there's the little hookup dots. I don't think that those are on the actual real suits from Space Force people, but 
also you wouldn't be able to see a, a, a back muscle in in the uh, in a leather type of suit but I'm putting that there for form because it's going to be in color here in a couple minutes. Same thing with his, like, I don't know what he's wearing there. Some kind of, like, I'm ready to be into a spacesuit sort of uh, deal going on there. Most of that's going to be in color back here. So I won't worry too much about some of the... And you can see I don't really follow... I can kind of follow what's there, but I don't have to. There's no real rules. These are just, like, screens and transparent transparent futuristic looking screen so I might have to do do a little bit of work in Photoshop to like add some you know special effects to that page before it goes to print or the print ready file Somebody else asked what I, the classic, what, what am I drawing with um, tools, I guess. Um, this is an iPad pencil. And this is an iPad Pro on a Sketchboard Pro. So it just kind of sits inside. Take a little quick look here of what the Sketchboard Pro looks like. That's the Sketchboard Pro. It's the iPad and procreate is the app and that's kind of the setup and then up in front of me i have you know a couple chat screens and files and stuff and then you know here i am too i just thought that this was maybe a good uh, good view of seeing the actual board set up and uh, the actual drawing screen. If I had a guest in the future, they their little head would be over on the left-hand side there on the feet. Maybe we can get like some writers I've worked with or some other local artists or other hustling artists out there. Or maybe we can get someone like, you know, someone famous. Maybe we can get Bob Kirkman on here to say, you know, Robert Kirkman on here to say like, do you remember that? Do you remember that monkey man story? <laughs> so I think he would. I think he would remember the monkey man story because that year at that year at Pittsburgh Comic Con, what we did was we had a table full of bananas. <laughs> so we had the comic book out and printed, self published by Brian Lynch. And uh, we had the banners and all that jazz. And uh, I got fresh bananas. And so we were giving out bananas, and it was a, it was a hit. And that was also the year that Andy Melanakis was there. So Andy Melanakis, you might know that name. He was around that crew, you know, the Angry Naked Pat, Angry Naked Comics uh, crew. And he came in just to check out the Comic-Con that weekend. This was before he was famous, but he looks like a nine-year-old. And he's really like, you know, old. So it's, you know, hilarity ensues when you go out to eat with that guy. <laughs> and, uh. I got to tell the Nikolai Volkov story now because it's in my head. But Andy Melanakis was hanging out. No one knows who he is. Keep in mind, this is before he had the Andy Melanakis show and uh, before he was famous, right? And Andy was cruising around the Comic Con with his little VCR camera, his VHS, you know, handheld cam thing. And, um, that's enough for that panel. All right. Um, and Nikolai Volkov was there with his manager 
and they're dressed in their gear, you know, they're doing their thing. And Andy goes up to them and messes with people. So I, I just happened to be walking around taking a break from the table and I saw him messing with the Nikolai Volkov and uh, Nikolai's manager. And he's asking him questions on camera like, why are you guys dressed like Nazis? <laughs> And they sung the uh, national anthem and stuff. So Andy's like walking up and they're like, we're not Nazis, we're Russian. And he's like, well, you look like Nazis. <laughs> like That's not cool. And they're like getting mad. They're just bad. They're like, what is this? Like, they don't know how to react to Andy because he looks like a nine-year-old kid, you know, or a child. So they're trying to be nice. Nikolai and Nikolai's ignoring him, but the manager's pissed. He's dressed up in his Russian outfit, you know. And uh, Andy wouldn't leave it alone. He was relentless. He just kept asking, like, really controversial stuff to get them to get a, you know, on video. And uh, it's a big boom outside. Um, anyways. Yeah, they were confused. So that night, we're at the bar across the street, the restaurant. No, at the lobby bar, I think. And, uh, you know, Andy's getting relentlessly carded, and his drink of choice was Grey Goose vodka. So Andy Belanoc is sitting there down in Grey Goose. Like, he'd just get a whole bottle. And then, of course, the, the manager of the restaurant would come over and be like, oh, uh, hey, so we don't want to bother you, but... Can you see your ID? He would get carded like five times and he was used to it. But it was funny watching the reactions and Andy knew Andy was like all about like, let's get these reactions from people. <laughs> and in walks Nikolai Volkov in and his manager in normal clothes because they're about to enjoy like a burger or something. And they look over and they see Andy with Grey Goose and they're at the bar like, what what like what they're letting this nine-year-old kid drink in pittsburgh like what is happening and uh <laughs> so andy tells the waitress he's like what's the what's the gayest looking drink you have and she's like what and he's like the, the fruitiest the the front like the you know colorful you know happiest looking cocktail she's like well, i don't know it's shirley temple and he goes perfect can you put some extra fruit in there and like and then send it over to them from me and so uh she does and we're just sitting there waiting like oh my god and the lady goes over gives the fruity extra fruity looking colorful drink to nikolai and points over to Andy, and Andy's like, hold on, I gotta do this on camera for everybody. Andy's like, mm, like, hello, like, it's for me. And they did, they just were like mortified. Like they had no idea what, how to react. Like they didn't know if they were on, like, I don't know. They're like, what the hell is happening in Pittsburgh? <laughs> And, uh, yeah, that's my Andy Milanakis, uh, <laughs> Pittsburgh Comic Con. Everything kind of comes together because that was the year that Kirkman was, was giving us the, the info. Um, bizarre. It wasn't probably months later that Andy blew up and got his own. Got on Jimmy Kimmel and became a, a giant name, I guess. He used to, Andy Melanakis used to have a comic, or yeah, not a comic, but a, a little show online before YouTube, really. It was called Ice Cream Fantastic, where he did the same thing, where he would go in and buy cigarettes and uh, mess with people, pretty much. Pranks. Kind of pr kind of pranks. It was always very, oh, I don't know what the word is. Eccentric humor. 
yeah. I drew his ice cream fantastic logo for him, which was basically his face with a bunch of ice cream on top of his head. Like the ice cream coat was on top of his head. And the ice cream was dripping down like about four or five flavors worth of ice cream. This guy here reminds me of uh, Dirk the Daring from Dragon's Lair. Now that I'm looking at this spacesuit thing that he's wearing, kind of, I don't know if anybody knows what that, what I'm even talking about. I would usually have music or something playing when I'm drawing, but I've been told that if you do that during a stream, they'll flag it and shut your stream off and ban you from YouTube. And, uh, like, you know, whatever. That's what I mean about the uh, the details. I don't really I'm gonna zoom in a little bit further. So, well, that's good enough, I guess. This is a pretty simplified sketch, but I'm gonna, you know do a little bit more of the emotion of what this guy is saying. He's kind of saying, what's a, what's a one six or one nine six five. It's kind of curious look. So yeah. And again, I'm just reminding myself in my mind, stop, stop noodling with so many details because a lot of these, you know, a lot of this broke, a lot of this nose and stuff will be in color and I can actually do that part in the coloring phase. Corey says he doesn't know how he wasn't subscribed before, but he's resolved that now. And that's okay. I, I haven't really done much with YouTube. This is the first time. Mm, yeah, this is really the first one besides the one that I did yesterday of the stream that I'm going to be doing here. So, yeah, definitely make sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel. Um, the links are wherever you'll find them. Just look, just look if you really care. If you really care about me, you'll at least give me a subscribe on YouTube. It doesn't cost anything. Is that how the YouTubes work now? I don't know. No, I know. I'm in YouTube land all day at work. I, we work with tons of YouTubers and yeah, that kind of really gave me the confidence too that like oh, I could all right, I could do a stream. I'll do it. I find streaming kind of boring a little bit normally. Like I don't like just doing like a hey today I'm gonna work on this face. And uh I don't like that. I'm also not a big tutorial. I don't feel like I'm a good teacher, so um I would rather just do something like this where I'm kind of talking as I'm going and you know, letting people know my thinking as I'm working, whether it's a story or 
me noodling around with an eye too much. Yeah. Now we're going to go dark there. Okay, we can probably... Nope, that eye's messed up. Messed that one up. Wasn't paying attention. That is a new challenge for digital art. Is, you know, you're, usually when you're drawing traditionally on Bristol board, you can only draw one size. You know? You're on eleven by seventeen with a with the iPad. You're you're able to zoom way in. So suddenly I'm at one hundred sixty percent. You know, instantly. So I'm zooming way the freak in. No one's ever going to look at this face or this crooked mouth here. But you know, I could and you could spend way too much time. Like I got to clean this up, right? But when it's actually print size, no one's ever going to see it. And if you take half the comics that you, you know, read and you actually blew them up, you would see all the inconsistencies and brush problems. And, you know, it's really the illusion of something on the page. The lines and subtle shapes. That's why I like to study uh, Alex Toth and... Uh, all the people that are inspired by Toth too, because I see um, one of my favorite artists right now is Chris Samney, who, uh, there you go again, small world, six degrees of Robert Kirkman. Uh, he's doing firepower right now for uh, Robert Kirkman. But Chris Samney's art is just, I mean, it's like Alex Toth was reborn. That's kind of how I see it. Like, I really enjoy watching or looking at his art. I love the Daredevil. I got the artist edition Daredevil that sits downstairs, and I just like cracking that open sometimes and looking at the simple shapes. Um, I showed already in the other stream, but I'll show it in this. One of the ways that I uh, figured out the lettering size, well, here's a little Alex Toth inspired. Zorro that I did. Yeah, um, one of the one of the ways that I figured out um, the lettering size for this nine. It's technically a nine by fourteen canvas that I'm working on. A little technical, go, going deep here. This is what this is about. I wanted to figure out the font size that would be legible if I drew the fonts or if I made the fonts directly in instead of taking the fonts into Photoshop to save us space. So I went in and I screenshotted a Chris Samney page from a Captain America uh, page and I pasted it in my template just to see like and I was impressed like look at how many panels there's going on on this page and it's cool storytelling right and again if we zoom in you know we're seeing the you know the imperfections of a line and how it's just shapes and look at this scribble like that's not grass that's a lot of a lot of noodling um, but it looks sweet I mean that's some cool dry brush effects going on look at this craven that's cool like I like to just go in and look and absorb and go oh cool look at that look at that like from a distance that's Captain America classically jumping through a window or a wall but when you zoom in it's the subtlest of shapes, right? And that's that should be inspiring for any other artists out there thinking like, oh, I suck. Anyway, so that, that this is how I figure out my lettering size was I faded out the page and I go in and I take some font in, take the Blambot font I'm using, I'm using Spinner Rack, and I just matched the size so that I knew and then I copied those out so that I could... Um, know that if I'm doing the actual text in here and the text is final and it goes to print, um, that this font size on this page will look good on a classic comic size print. 
So that's a little bit about what's going on on this page. And I thought I'd show that a couple times. I'll probably share it again too. If, if there's a question, if someone asks like, how do you know what's up with your fonts, dude? I'll be like, that's how I do it. That's how it's done. A lot of tinkering and looking at what other people are doing and um, yeah. I think I'm all set here. So, yeah, got to be careful not to noodle noodle things to death when you're um, working on stuff. But this can all be in, you know, colored lines and, you know, space station type nubbins. Cool. All right. Probably when I'm done with these streams, I'll go back and uh, timestamp when I made the, if I, is that way you don't have to scan through a four hour stream to see, to hear me talk about, you know, a certain thing that I put in the show notes. Like who knew I was going to talk about Andy Melanakis today, but I did. And that's a great story. Everyone should know it. <laughs> Funny side story to that, uh, I was told recently last, when we were, the last comic convention I ever did. Uh, May of, uh, May of 2019, I think. Um, James Patrick, the writer I've worked with a lot. He was there, he witnessed the Andy Melanakis giving um, Nikolai Volkov, a Shirley Temple. But he's like, do you remember the wheelchair lady? And I'm like, what? And he's like, I, this lady is, almost died. The wheelchair was hurling out of control after we were done in that restaurant. And I was like, what? No. And then I did remember. I was like, oh, man, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so someone, some lady was in a wheelchair and we all came outside and this lady was out of control and her hands were in the air and she was like, ah, help me, help me. And she's wheeling and going downhill into traffic. And we thought it was like a joke. And Andy was laughing. Like Andy was like, look at that lady. And we're like, no, that's real. And luckily, as I remember it, I got, you know, she, she did not die. Uh, someone caught her at the last minute, but it was like, holy shit. But imagine your last um, imagine your last view on this earth is Andy Melanakis on the side of like someone that looks like a nine year old kid laughing at you as you're out of control on your wheelchair. How awful. So Leslie Rolden says, I can barely see, but are you using an iPad with Procreate? Yeah. So uh, let me go switch it up. This is the iPad setup. It's sitting in a Sketchboard Pro so that I can have it, you know, at an angle on my on my desk. But that's the iPad, and uh, I'm just trying to give a couple different angles while I'm working here. But there we go. Get that set up. Cool. Yeah, I prefer doing all of my comics now inside of Procreate. I think my dog wants to go out of this room right now. Go on. Okay. Okay. And again, 
and I'm pretty zoomed in there. Like this is going to be such a small panel that I, I shouldn't be worried too much about the details on this face, but it's it's kind of it's easy to noodle and kind of get into details that don't matter when they're on the um, when they're going to be on the um, printed page ultimately. <laughs> I forgot how many Comic-Con stories I have. And I actually thought I forgot about, you know, how many Comic-Cons I did. It doesn't seem like in my mind, I'm, I'm like, I barely did any Comic-Cons, but I did a lot. Did a lot of Comic-Cons. Kind of stopped for a while, so I didn't really have a need to go. And I just kind of lost, you know, lost the interest, really, um, being busy at work. And, but now I miss them. I miss, I miss hanging out, you know. This is pretty much what I would do at a convention all day anyways. I would sit and draw, you know, fan art, usually. Uh, not, not actual comic work, but... I really do miss the comic cons and I, it hurts to know that so many of my friends that rely on those, um, you know, streams of income. Uh, what a terrible thing that has happened for their incomes. And it just sucks. You got to hang in there. It'll come back. Okay, so we got the Starbase. That'll all be outer space colors in a minute. Oh, my dog has now arrived again. She's checked things out and <laughs> Okay, cool. So yeah, that's what I was saying earlier about the fun of working in Procreate is that these details really don't matter um, when I'm sketching because, and since I'm doing the final art, so we got these two small, you know, real basic shapes for people walking and they probably have their spacesuits on. So I'll just go right in and, and start noodling with the, uh, now, this guy is probably a, an assistant of some kind that's helping this person put their, you know, get their pack on. This is the pack. And you don't have to worry about too many details here because when you are zoomed out, just like that Captain America panel I showed, as long as you get the basic shapes correct, um, it's going to look real. It's going to look right. So... You know, it's cool. Okay. And we'll just pretend that he already has his helmet on. I'm tempted to look at, um, you know, look at the old comics right now to see what the, the helmet looks like and all that stuff. But it's really not that necessary. It's kind of like a recipe, you know, like, are you really going to miss that ingredient? Then add it. And this person's not wearing a pack, so I didn't mess that up. So, okay, cool. shape and really if you as an artist you can teach yourself how to noodle just by like scribbling and making shapes into nothing that's always a fun process for sketchbooks and um 
to really I'll show you what I mean actually. I got a I got a screen where I was <laughs> so no, maybe not. It's kind of a flight pose. Is this it? No? Yeah, so there's a lot of like looking at poses and um, just sketching things from life. I do a lot of life drawing and stuff in here too. Um, for fun, I could have sworn I had a kind of like a how to draw thing going on in here. I'm going to look in the miscellaneous folder. Oh, never mind. Wait, I'm going to look one more time just to see if it's in here. No. Nope. Go back in the... See, I get myself distracted. Anyways, I used to scribble lines, and I still do it to this day. I will take, like, a whole page and just do, like, abstract lines and make them connect and jump like that. Same thing with this cockpit. I'm not going to worry too much about the details that are inside. Just that we know that there's a seat here, and there's some control panels, and there's some background doodads. You know, that's enough to know what's going on in this panel. And I uh, should be able to fill in a little bit of subtle, subtle color stuff. Um, let's see here. This wing's a little slippy. No. Okay. Like that. Nope. Don't want a full triangle. Want to be kind of sloped. Little engines. And like I said earlier, I kind of designed these <clears throat> as I was on the, you know, blue lines. So they're just real simple shapes. So it's just kind of fun to make it up. Sometimes people spend way too much time doing character designs and development and never actually getting stuff onto the page. Um, let's see, another question here. It's easier to place the conversation bubble before the actual drawing. Well, let's see. I would probably say that if I had a script, oh, I'm going to turn off all these lines here for a minute. Um, Let me see if I can find the. I don't have the, uh, the thumbnail for this one, but but yeah, I would probably uh, let's just do a real quick replay here of this page. So far, time lapse replay. Okay. So there's my fonts. 
you can see that I've now I, I I know the script in my mind a little bit. I know the plot. So I'm actually writing directly on in font. So I know what's going on in this scene. I've already figured it out thumbnail wise. And then when I'm getting into like, okay, there's probably see you can see I've added a I've added like there's probably a caption here, you know, and then when I start to actually get in and watch this, it's gonna start writing real fast here in a minute. Um boom, 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 boom. I'm writing the script. I'm like, da, 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 right? I turn that off, but I come back to it as I flesh it out. So even if I don't know the exact words that they're saying, it's kind of like the marble method of um, of writing your comic. I kind of know, okay, cool. And I've changed, I've come back in and changed um, the, the fonts a bit or changed the uh, text, I mean, over time. So I kind of build in the where the lettering goes. I think definitely helps to 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 kind of know the composition of your panels, even if you're working from a script from a writer that's like panel one, panel two. I would want to um, to build that into the flow of the panel. Oh, okay. I hope that answers the question. Um, sometimes getting those, I mean, having them out of the way, because look look what I did there. I, I didn't finish that line. So having those things, I, I mean, I know where they're, that they're there, but having those things not there and turning them off, I should have probably drawn through. So, well, Oh, on the wrong layer, probably here. Let's see. Yep. So something there's a line that's not close somewhere, right? Cool. For the sake of you know continuity, you should probably have a even though even though I know there's a bubble there, I'm just gonna go ahead and trace the. where the bay door would be. Mm -hmm. I think that's fine. I some sort of, I don't even know what this is. It could be like a bay door or like where these things open up or maybe it's a window. I'll kind of figure that out. I'm probably coloring mostly. Um, but there should be things, basic things like there is a shadow underneath this ship. So I know that. And that's the basic spotting of blacks or black spotting areas. Alex Raymond, famous comic artist, called them pools of quiet because, yeah, they're like areas that pause the mind when you're on a page. I thought that was neat. And also you can use them to notice how it's kind of pointing, pointing this way. It's like an arrow. So you can use shapes a lot to help the flow of where you want the reader's eye to go. So there is kind of an art to it. Not many people think about that. And not that I thought about it too much. I know that I wanted there to be a shadow underneath those, the craft and it needed to be black, but it does help point to the next, to the next balloon, you know, down here. So I'm okay with that.
really the first five pages of this comic are kind of an opening setup scene. So not that these are throwaway things. I mean, you might see these ships sometime in the future again, or maybe they'll change a little bit, but really they're not that important. But they're there to kind of drive the, the plot. So I want to give them a little bit of design. And um, again, we can see that there's, <clears throat> I haven't really drawn anybody in there, but I kind of denoted that there was already a pilot in this seat. So I'm going to just go in with my inks and make that so. Even if it's just the, the casual shape of, well, it looks like I put an arm like he's maybe buckling his seatbelt. That's kind of the shape I was going for, I think, when I drew that. Just putting a seatbelt on. And again, you can get away with a lot of, you know, I'm zoomed way in. There's no need to, there's no need to do what I'm doing right now. So I'm, I'm telling myself that in my mind, I'm like, this is noodling. You're wasting time, I'm wasting everyone's time. Um, people like, uh, masters like Alex Raymond and, Alex Toth would say, man, get to it, you know, get to the point. Alex Toth would say, uh, simplify. You know, he would probably slap me right now for all the noodling I'm doing. When I think about those inspirational guys when I'm drawing a lot of the times. And it helps me kind of get moving. Stop thinking about it so much. You know, you want to move the story along with a panel. You don't really want to paint the Sistine Chapel, if that makes sense. Or, you know, if that's your deal, then that's cool. I don't really have a deadline either, but I'd like to put out a book sooner or later. Um, I don't want to wait and... So in order to do that, I need to not spend eight weeks working on a freaking comic page. Which is also why a lot of uh, <laughs> a lot of uh, professional comic artists these days don't work out. They spend too much time working on um, Okay, so I was going to put a flag on that wing. Um, can't meet the deadlines. Or the artwork is so... Um, simplified or rushed. Because they don't feel like they're confident in doing their own... Their own thing, or their editors suck. And it's... It's a bad combination. The fans suffer, really. If the fans are looking for... Uh, no, so I'm just doing a subtle classic uh, Air Force or you know, Army military badge on the wing there. That's fine. Okay. I don't know what's going to be over here. There's probably going to be some kind of call sign. And I'd probably do it in probably Photoshop. So I'm just going to mark that. I think it'll look better if I curve it with real numbers. So we're going to do that.
enough. Close enough for that. Okay. Let's get some like even though I don't want to do like a full grid, it's nice to um kind of lay down some um, lines of the perspective of this room so that we know it's a down shot. The readers know it's a down shot. And clearly it is, but sometimes on space stations, there's, you know, panels and things on the floors just randomly. Right? Or doodads like, you know, maybe there's some gear over here. Um, another artist to check out is Junji Kim. He's a Korean artist that uh, you can look up on YouTube, I'm sure. He just draws from nothing. He does a lot of this noodling, but he sees the image in his head first. And, you know, I'm not doing anything like that. I'm just saying there might be some kind of like gear here that helps work on this engine or fuel up this engine, right? And there's the hint of another wing. So we know that there's four ships sitting here. So that might give it the illusion of, well, it must be like a fleet of these things up there in the star base. Right? I look at his eye and I go, okay. You always want the top eyelid to have a little bit more weight. So just to pop it off a little bit. Um, okay, okay, that's looking decent. What I'm doing was when I'm like thinking, okay, uh, you know, this panel is ready to color for me. These panels are ready to color for me. This panel is ready to color pretty much for me. Um, No. And I don't want to I don't want to jump into that until I get to this. So and this is the fun the fun parts. So I've been at this for two hours now. Boy, the time really flies. You know. I think that's it. Jungjin Kim, is that? I'm, I'm, I'm subscribed to his YouTube, but I can't look right now. But uh, I'll put it in the. I'll put it in the show notes, maybe. But I could watch those that guy's videos. Like he just starts with a blank piece of paper and just draws from nothing. He doesn't even sketch. It's just the whole freaking thing comes to life and it's magic. And that ties back to um, what I was saying at the beginning of this stream about Jack Kirby. One of the stories that was told that I remember hearing at that first you know, Life of Jack Kirby panel from Mark Avenier and um, Sergio Aragonas. They said that the people that got to watch, there's not, a, there's not a whole lot, there's no video of, a whole lot of video at all of Jack, Jack Kirby actually drawing anything. And, um, you know, not for any reason why, it was just a different age. People just didn't have handy candy cams and uh, smartphones like laying around and Jack was usually always drawing something that was doing some like for a purpose he was usually working but anyways they said that he would draw without sketching he would just start in the top right panel and um, would then like kind of magically fill out the panel and I thought that's bullshit when I heard that story back then, I thought, well, that's just what they, you know, but they were mesmerized, they would say, 
and how he would start from nothing and just fill in the panel from the top left to the bottom right. The lines would just appear. And whenever I saw Jean G drawing, I thought, holy cow, that's what Kirby was able to do, like an automatic drawing. So you see the lines in your head and you just are able to put them right on paper. That's freaking amazing. And now that I've watched people do that, I'm like, that's exactly what Kirby was doing. He was able to, to do that, which think about the time that that saves you when you don't have to sit and sketch and noodle and you just know what's gonna happen on your comic pages. And it's no doubt then to me why he was able to draw a full issue of a comic book in a weekend. You know, 20, 22 pages in two days. It seems inhuman or magic, but it was real. Sometimes multiple issues a month, a lot of times multiple issues a month, and a lot of times breakdowns for other pages, other comics. And that guy was a machine, that was magic. But it wasn't, it was just trained, how he trained himself to draw. And I think about that a lot when I'm drawing because I noodle myself to death some days. And there was recently an article from Neil Kirby and there's not a whole lot out about Neil Kirby. That's Jack Kirby's son who's, you know, he's an old man now too. And he said he used to go to the dungeon. That's what Jack Kirby called his... Uh, office there's a little studio in new york where all the old things were created and it was real musty not musty but cigar smelling basement barely any sunlight like a little basement window coming in almost damp moldy kind of smell books and all of his reference materials and a little TV and a little radio. And um, Neil Kirby kind of described the magic of watching his dad draw or that him and his friends sometimes got a chance to do that. And they were all like mesmerized, like how, how in the world are, is he doing that? And it's not something that I feel like everybody can do. Although I've seen videos online that say, <clears throat> learn how to automatic draw. And I've, I've looked at that and uh, like automatic drawing. There's tricks to it, but it's not something that I think everybody can do. I think it's something that's out of necessity maybe for someone like Jack Kirby, who was just working his butt off and trying to feed his family and trying to do as many pages as possible, uh, learning how to speed up time for a lot of those comic artists at the time was a key. So Alex Toth and, um, Norm Sickles. Milton Kniff. They all worked on uh, daily comic strips and they would have to um, I'm just going to grid that out there. Um, they would have to try to figure out ways to uh, speed up their panels. So they use the Churascaro 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 method, Churascaro method, I think it's called, which is a lot of silhouettes and fill up blacks. So that's why a lot of the old comics are like that. They're just like black silhouettes, a lot of heavy shapes because it was quicker 
to uh, fill that up. And then it's effective, especially for a newspaper comic strip. It's pretty cool. And again, I'm just going to denote that there's going to be some numbering on here. I'm going to do that in Photoshop. We'll do the rest in Procreate. And that's going to be really dark too, but. Yeah, see, I can noodle right here because I see the sketch and undertone, but really that's enough for that ship for me because I'm going to color it. So those are just the basic guidelines. The rest of the noodling I can do in actual color work. Uh, so I don't want to mess with that too much more. The lines for me now have to just be about the, the subtle uh, guidelines of where shapes are happening and key things are happening on the, I don't like that that's touch of that. I don't like that. You gotta watch that. Tangents. When like lines accidentally kind of just touch another line and it kind of just does something to your brain when you're looking at art and it doesn't look right. It's probably better to separate and not have like a nice flow. I don't know how to explain what I'm saying. Tangent lines aren't good in comics. That's all I can say. I'm gonna make sure that that's not happening and fix it when you see it. It's one of the things that comic editors will tell you. Because I think that's probably one of the things that someone trained a comic editor to say <laughs> when they're doing submissions. Oh, we got some tangents going on here. All right. Leslie, you said that's a cool looking ship. Well, thank you. And I'm thinking about the color too, because I don't know, like, you know, of course I'm thinking like a sleek silver, you know, silver bluish mirror looking thing. Try to figure that out in the coloring. The coloring stage. Mm -hmm. I forgot to turn my phone off. <laughs> 
Put that on Do Not Disturb. Shoot. So something about being pulled out of once you get into the zone, right? So if you're an artist or musician, you know what I'm talking about, or anybody that concentrates on something for a long time, whether it's woodwork or craft, or you get in this like Zen feeling, and it's really easy to lose track of time. And um, it's a good feeling. Like you forget to eat. You can forget to function in life <laughs> outside of uh, drawing. So it's you got to temper it. You can't do it all the time. But um, once you're in it and then something pulls you out, like a phone call or some negativity that creeps in to your life, it pulls you out of that zone and it's kind of like being waking up from a dream. So you're a little confused when you're trying, like, I gotta get back. I gotta go back to the dream. I gotta go back to sleep to get back to that dream. That's what that feels like. If I'm in the zone, doing that deep work, and then something pulls me out of it, then I just ruin it. You can kind of ruin it. So, streaming put my freaking phone to do not disturb and uh, I don't want to think about anything else when I'm doing this there's a couple little tricks I can use when I'm coloring to fix that up because page you know I don't know what you're looking at I don't know what it looks like on the screen but Print size, it's probably going to be, you know, about that big. So I shouldn't be noodling as much as I am, but I am. And then I don't know. Kind of iron it up. Gonna mess up the, the angle of that engine peeking out, but that's okay. That's okay, you can fix it. That's good enough. That's another thing too. I think people overthink comics a little bit. Like uh, I could sit and I can sit and noodle with this stuff all day, and try to make it perfect or some realistic looking thing. But I don't know. I think that I like the cartoony stuff, and I think something that's more animated looking and kind of not perfect. People are going to look at this for like a second. And one of the tricks of comics is that a lot of what's happening in the reader's mind, you don't get to decide. It happens between the panels. So you might be in your mind thinking, wow, these ships are awesome. They're flying down. They're going to zoom into the atmosphere. But I didn't show any of that. Just being subtle, that it blasted from the space station. We didn't even see them leaving the station. They just, here's the guys getting in there. And the next panel is this. So, like, yeah, thinking about understanding how comics works. So if you are an artist and haven't read Understanding Comics by Scott McCloud, do that. That should be in everybody's 
bookshelf somewhere and just zone out on that. So once you really start to think about how the brain works, he even covers the things, you know, the basic things about um, what I was saying about human shape, the shapes that, that kind of denote a human face or a body or And if you're an artist that's like super realistic, well, good luck. You might have a career for a little while there, <laughs> but usually you can't keep up with the deadlines when you're doing super hyper realistic um, artwork. So it's better to put those guys on like longer term graphic novels and not have a deadline or something. But if you're doing work for yourself, like I am, I could take forever too, but I don't want to. I want to make sure that I'm putting stuff out on a decent deadline for myself. I don't have one for this book yet. Uh, I'm hoping that it's going to be about 24 pages. Standalone adventure with the characters from uh, Secret Forces. So you don't need to have... You don't need to have like six issues or even a background story. You could just pick this one thing up and jump right in and have some fun with it. I like that. That's kind of um, that's kind of what I like about comics, and we've kind of gotten away from it in uh, comic book land. You have to have a $7 issue and <laughs> buy all 20 copies to understand what's going on. I'm not into that. I'm not hating on it because there is a place for like the longer form comics. But for me personally, I just want to make a comic that people will, will um, be able to pick up. Like not just comic. That's another thing that I said yesterday's stream was one of my goals is to i don't want my audience for my comics i don't care if other artists watch me or are inspired or whatever but i don't want the audience for my comic book to be just people that draw comics or want to draw comics or i don't i want to get this in the hands of maybe a couple you know quite a few uh, kids or um, people that aren't haven't thought about comics in a while they know about comics or maybe people that have never read comics because they've grown up in this digital age and like a comic book seems special to them when it's in print and they're like wow this is cool I want more of this and if they say okay they read something and they're like what, what's the next issue out then great but it's not a continuation of the story. I don't want this to be standalone adventure. That's my goal. And again, I'm gonna noodle myself to death here, but this is water. And I'll use a trick in a minute to we'll flat this page out probably right now. Still good with two hours, 19 minutes. Got the inks laid down. I talked a lot, said a lot of stories. Had some fun questions from people and Thanks for hanging out. It's keeping me honest <laughs> on a Saturday uh, afternoon. I think at two o'clock I'm supposed to leave and go to the farmer's market. But I wanted to be sure to stream today. And I think I'm going to probably do something on Saturday mornings. Um, I want to do something on the weeknights. I want to stream on a weeknight. 
I don't know what that will be or what that looks like, but I probably won't be able to do a full page. And then I want to do a, a Monday morning sort of, um, I mean, a Saturday morning wake up and draw sort of thing to maybe inspire some of my friends to get up with me and, you know, hey, why not, why not wake up on a Saturday morning and draw from, you know, get six hours in, you know, let's do that. Four hours, even if you put a couple hours into your comics, you should invest in yourself even once a week. If that's all you can do, get to it. Don't just sleep in or whatever. All right. Now we're going to block out this page and do some flatting. So my process again, I'm just going to lay down a gray for the base. And we, this will go a little fast. This will be a little boring to watch here, but basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to create giant gray squares or rectangles. Underneath the lines, you know, make sure that's all connecting underneath there and then fill it in and I'll isolate in a minute. I'm going to isolate this layer so that, you know, the color can't spill outside of this, of these panels. So we'll do this one now. Uh, what? I've really grown to enjoy the coloring part. And when you approach a page, um, when you approach the page as like the person that's doing all of the steps, I could have probably done this a lot, um, a lot quicker, but I wanna, I, I do wanna do the sketching and the inking. So those are the steps of comics, like the rough, the rough pencils, the writing, then the inks, you know, maybe tightening pencils if you're going to be serious about really detailing out something. Um, um, and then when you get to the coloring phase, here Rich is asking, what's flattening? So flatting for colors is kind of the first step that a colorist, a comic colorist would do. And sometimes they even have assistants that do it called flatters. They get paid, you know, 20 to 15 bucks a page, 15, $20 a page. I think that's what most of the flatters I know would get paid 20, 20 bucks a page, something like that to come in and isolate the shape. So I want to do the background first. So we're going to have a, oh, come on now. So the basic panels, I'll get a block and it's usually we start with gray. I don't know why. Or this like really muddy green gray that they use. I've seen. Uh, yeah, so this is gonna be all flatted down here. So we're getting all gray down there. Whoop, nope, I don't want that. Um, and then I'm able to isolate and I'll show that in a minute. Just a minute. But for flatting, we want to just get the basic shapes. So these big giant shapes are forms like uh, squares and rectangles. So that's your base. And then, so you can see the layers here. I got this this gray layer. These gray blocks are on layer 20. You know, I was going to be the name of the right. Oh. Flatting. Okay, then I'm going to do a, a second layer of color flats and that would be for the, and I'm going to use a, like a lighter, um, like a lighter color, like a lighter gray. And those are for the, the figures or the key elements, um, on the page. Okay. So now, as I'm, I'm going to do this while I'm going to answer this next thing, because um, Leslie says I should do that too. I want to draw comics. 
but I haven't started my day. I haven't started because of your mate because of your day job, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have a full time day job, so I work more than 40 hours a week. <laughs> um, I work at a place called spreadshop.com. So we do custom merchandise for or we allow people to make custom merchandise for their comment. Uh, that's like a plug. Hey, they're not they're not sponsoring me here. But that's my day job, and it's pretty draining. Um, I talked about this in yesterday's patron stream. You know, at the end of the day, it's like uh, after you've worked a full time job, no matter what it is, it's um it's draining, and uh, you you know you in the morning you're thinking. I'm going to work on my comic tonight. Tonight's the night. And at the end of the day, you're like, shit. Nope. I got nothing left in the creative gas tank and my brain is full for the day. And I just can't, I'll, I'll do it tomorrow. I'll do it tomorrow. And you put it off and you put it off and you put it off. And then months go by and days go by and you just never work on anything. And the real thing that started to make me mad. Now I love my day job. Don't get me wrong. Don't fire me, spread shop. Uh, the thing that made me mad, not personally mad at anyone or anything like that, was I was tired and I'd given all my energy to something else, which is fine because I do like to give my all with whatever I'm working on. But... Then I would sit on the couch and watch Netflix or watch a show. And some, and you know, I'll be honest, some of the nights were just, I'm not really watching anything. I'm just kind of sketching and just, if I'm working on anything for a while, I'm just zoned out and I'm tired and I'm like, I'm just going to go to sleep. Or I'm watching a show or a documentary and I feel like I'm, I'm lying to myself. And I feel like I'm feeding my brain. And I'll still say that, you know, as I'm watching a cartoon or... <laughs> a random documentary of some kind. But I am tired, and it's hard. And I feel like anything I produce is going to be crap after a long day at work. But the thing that made me mad was now I'm taking the left, you know, I'm, I'm left with pretty much nothing of a day before it's time to go to bed and do it all over again. And now the little bit of time that I have left, I'm giving that time to Netflix or uh animal crossing <laughs> yeah i played animal yeah i played some animal crossing i know what's up and uh that bothered me that i was giving my time and you know not to get morbid or anything but that's all we have so i would think about friends that just passed away, creator friends and non-creator friends, and how much they would have done with time had they been given it, more of it. And how lucky I am that I can function and my hands work and my arms work. And I think about that every day when I wake up. So I'm a stoic thoughts too. I mean, it's pretty deep. I'm not a religious person by any means at all, but I am, uh, I study stoicism. And uh, one of the th main thoughts that most people think is, oh, that's morbid, is you're going to die one day. And no person on their deathbed ever said, I wish I would have watched more Netflix <laughs> or whatever, right? And that just always, those thoughts always stick with me. And so some people pray when they wake up in the morning. We're going deep now. This is it. We're in the deep zone. So there's four people watching this. So you're going to get the deep thoughts. I'm not religious. And, uh, but the people that pray in the morning and the people that pray at night, I'm doing the same thing, but I'm thinking about gratitude and, um, when I wake up in the morning and my feet touch the ground, I'm like, man, how lucky am I? I get to do it all again. <laughs> Whatever is going to be in front of me this day. 
and uh, Marcus Aurelius uh, in Meditations said that you shouldn't hide under the covers. You were born to do the work, whatever that is. Or get to it. Humans were born to work together and do whatever that work is you're doing and do it to the best of your ability, whether it's a plowing a field or working at a t-shirt company. <laughs> uh, and I, I love that mindset. It really sets off my day really well. And, um, but, you know, deep down, I do want to, I have these things I want to do. And that I've done in the past. I've always drawn comics. And it gets to the point where you start meditating about, okay, these companies and these other people have my attention. And my attention is not best served to these other things. It feels good and it's comfortable. But, um, oh, I'm sorry, Leslie, I didn't mean to keep your name up there on blast, but all right. Um, so, yeah, it's not easy. So that's why I do want to do a weekend stream, I think, on a Saturday morning to encourage my friends to kind of wake up and draw. And, um, you know, I get up at 5 a.m. every day. Um, it takes me a little while to wake up, but, uh, I don't draw first thing in the morning and usually I, 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 I'm getting to work, you know, after I walk the dog and do my routine, I'm, I'm working, I'm getting to some things I have to do on my to-do list for work. I, originally I started waking up at five in the morning to do, uh, comics before work. But I didn't like to get in that zone, and then suddenly I'd get pulled out. And I found myself in that rut where I'm really enjoying my work at work, at my day job, but I'm not feeling personally fulfilled because I have all these comic ideas that I want to work on. And um, so now it's come to this, <laughs> and I'm going to try to stream as much as possible. So regardless, I mean, I might try and draw more not on stream. So these pages are not going to be done in order. You're not going to know what I'm working on really, but that doesn't matter. Um, so some nights it might only be an hour I might stream, but just to show and maybe motivate others that here I am, I'm exhausted. <laughs> I just worked, uh, you know, more than an eight hour day. And I'm drawing comics at you know eight o'clock to eleven o'clock on a weeknight when I'm gonna be up at five o'clock the next day. If that maybe motivates someone else to kind of try to work on their stuff, then that's cool. That's an extra bonus for me to do it. So okay, so we got those guys flying it in. But yeah, man, everybody needs a, you know, I don't want to say everybody needs a day job, but it's not what I mean to say. I don't think it's a bad thing to have a day job. I didn't, I worked full time for 13 years doing illustration and comics and all kinds of stuff. And there's good and bad with that. <clears throat> the good is, yeah, you're doing your own thing. The bad is it's sink or swim. And some years are good and some years are bad. And sometimes people aren't paying you the money that they owe you. And that doesn't really ever really end. Um, <laughs> but that can be stressful, not knowing where the next paycheck is going to come from. So I, I think the people that are really smart right now, not that I'm like saying that I'm super smart, are the people that can enjoy what they do for their day job and make sure that you schedule some time for you and invest in yourself and work on your own things and don't just give all of your energy to everyone else. That said, I'm probably still going to watch some, you know, Invincible 
this weekend and enjoy a holiday. I might watch King Kong versus uh, Godzilla at some point. You know. And investing in time, that's interesting. I think your time is what you got. That's all that you got is time. You can't get it back. But I was walking today and I was thinking, I need to, I'm paying, I'm, I'm paying, I'm investing in a lot more other things. Like I'm paying my bills and I have a little side hustle wallet for, you know, when I sell some things, digital brushes and things and, then I reinvest that stuff in myself, so that's good. But also my paycheck, your paycheck from whatever you're doing, your day job. You should, uh, oh, what did I do there? Did I mess that up? Okay. Um, you should invest in yourself. So if you take 10% of, uh, oops of your take home pay after bills and after responsibilities, whatever you're left with, even if it's whatever, it doesn't matter. Do the math, take 10%, throw it in a little file for yourself and call it, you know, your side hustle money. And that's, that's the money that you're going to spend on uh, investing in yourself, whether it's buying a course or some digital brushes or, um, you know, Buying a comic book that you want that's going to inspire you, maybe. Um, and I need to do that too. I need to. I mean, I, I can kind of buy what I want, but I, I need to be smarter with money too. And I think that it, I think that that ten percent thing is a good place to start. Some people will say fifteen, but I don't know. I think if you, let's say if you had $200 and you get, and you put yourself 20 bucks in a little bucket somewhere, that's going to add up over time. And then you'd be able to afford things like maybe a Facebook ad or, you know, I don't know, whatever it is. Maybe you've done that for a year and a convention is back and you want to buy a little table at a convention and go take your art there for sale. And now you've taken your $150 for that table spot if it's a decent sized table. And now you've made, you know, you made your table cost back. That's the that's the goal for a lot of people. <laughs> but say you got lucky and you actually doubled your table cost, then you've invested in yourself and good work. Good job, Leslie. You did it. You invested in yourself and uh, you've doubled your table costs. And now you can reinvest that you take 10% of that money from your profits and put it back in your bucket again, right? Spend the rest on whatever you want. But make sure you're um, putting a little aside. Pay yourself first. That's what That's what a lot of experts say. We don't usually pay ourselves. You know what? I can't get that out of my head. It's the story I said a little bit ago about the lady in the wheelchair that was running out of control with her hands above her head, going, help me, and everybody. And like... I don't know. I, don't, I barely remember it, but I, I remember it now. I just remember Andy Melanakis laughing at the, the lady, like, look at that, guys. And then some guy jumped out of nowhere and saved her. But I was like, oh, my God. Oh, my Lord. Oh. <sighs> I was with a colleague and, uh, or somebody. I don't know who I was with. I was in the Boston airport not too long ago. Like, well, a couple years back. And uh, PAX was in town, I think. 
PAX East or PAX Boston or something like that. And lately, there's been a lot of, um, you know, I guess there were always streamers at PAX, I want to say. But um, I'm looking, I'm waiting for my airplane, and there was walking in the aisle, like he just deported, just got off the plane, was Andy Milanakis, and he's wearing these big Elvis sunglasses and... Uh, I'm like, Andy. And I came up to him and I said, it's DJ. Because he wouldn't have recognized me to see my face with that at that point. Because I look way different than I did back in those comic days. I have tattoos and I don't wear a hat. I had different glasses. And he goes, holy cow, it's DJ Kaufman. What's good? And so we're just standing there talking. And like whoever I was with was like, you know you know Andy Milanakis? And I'm like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was good to bump into him. I'm glad he's doing better. I need some tough things going on for a while. He seems to have gotten healthy, and now he's a big streamer, so that's weird to watch him go from um, pre-internet, you know, pre-YouTube stuff, pre-prank, internet to being like one of the first people to do that to uh to now you know he had a tv show and uh now he's big on streaming i don't know i don't know anything about that but he's on twitch or something i don't know what he does now he raps he plays video games but good old andy Quite a character, that man. <laughs> cool. Almost done flattening out the, you know, the, the key things of this page, and then we can get into the actual coloring now. And these were recorded too, so I mean, I might, I might go back in and actually do the timestamps for people that are like watching it later. Say like, this is when I'm going to start the coloring process, but um, it's a little tedious, but it's fun. Once I get into the brush, br using the brushes. And... <laughs> Surprised my dog did not wake up. Usually anytime there's a car door outside, she's like alert. Um, but she's gonna she's gonna be alerted here in a minute. There she goes. She's like, what's up? Someone's coming to get me. Yeah. Yeah. There's someone out there. No. Okay. I'll let you out. Go on there. Oh boy. There she goes. That's what she's saying in dog speak right now is, what are you doing? Now? Why are you outside my house? Why are you slamming doors? I'm trying to sleep. <laughs> oh boy. She's upset. She'll calm down in a minute. Uh, have I ever uploaded anything onto Webtoon? So I got a Webtoon story. When Webtoon first came to the United States, they hired me because they were trying to 
break into uh, the North American comic market. They hired me to make a comic called The Webtoonist or something like that, or, or pitch them a comic, and I did it. That's probably somewhere on their platform. I don't know. And I really dug the, I, I dug the webtoon format um, a good bit. I like the mobile idea. And so, yeah, I've done a ton of stuff on the webtoon app. I even have a YouTube video in my channel somewhere that's pretty well viewed, I think, about how I was how I was making my webtoon and how I was slicing up the panels and stuff. Um, yeah. Webtoon's a good place to publish your comics. Um, a good place to start something. Um, especially if you're not thinking about printing your comic and you're just thinking about maybe, you know, making a comic and get, testing your skills and whatnot. I think that that's a good place to start. Um, and don't be discouraged if, like, you upload something and you don't have an audience. But um, another good one to look at on Webtoon is, uh, oh, boy, Steve Conley's comic. It's called The Age of, oh, boy. It's not coming to me right now. I'm even his patron, but Steve Conley is on there. If you look up Steve Conley Patreon, you'll, I mean, Steve Conley um, Webtoon, you'll find his comic. Um, he's got some videos that are nice about how to build your audience there and stuff like that. I stopped publishing on Webtoon because, and I'm going to tell you, I was really confused. Um, I was doing the daily comic strip, Secret Forces on there. It's still up. There's still some of it there. Um... And um, I started to get these notes that my comics were being deleted or judged or something like we uh, adult material in your comic. And I'm like, what? Cause I mean, I don't over sexualize anything that I'm doing or I try not to be, there's no sex in my comic and there's no, there's not even really any ultra violence or gore. It's mostly science fiction and fun and adventure and stuff like that. Um, so I was a little shocked that they, and then they said, these panels here are bad. And I, if I showed you the panels, you'd be like, what? It was just like a midriff, a lady wearing kind of like a skimpy midriff, but she was like in a surgical thing on like a surgical table sort of thing in one of my comics. And they took the comic down. So I reached out to them and I'm like, hey, this might be a mistake. Um, um And they were like, no, no mistake. We've judged your comics. And then they started, whoever it was, was like a community manager. She was just going through and just deleting like tons of my comics. And it was ruining the, 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 the flow. But I almost felt like, I don't know. I felt like, are they mad that I'm not doing like long form, you know, whatever. And this is a very American looking comic now. And like, this is not like I'm, I'm that kind of artwork that mostly they have there. I was starting to get really paranoid about like, why am I being singled out now? I haven't done anything here. And, but it, I got mad enough that I just said no more. I'm not doing the webtoon thing anymore. Um, because they just couldn't give me an answer. And I, I emailed the owner, the the founder, actually, because I, I know him. I'm friends with him on Facebook. So his name is Junko, Jun, Junko, Junku Kim similar to the other guy's name. Um, but yeah, I emailed him and I was like, yo man, I don't know what's going on with your editing, but I feel censored, <laughs> like super censored. And um, it stunk because I mean, I'm not being, I wasn't being paid anything to be on there. And I was putting a lot of work out and actually putting out a lot of promotion for them too, by telling people like you, um, to go on their, their platform, even other people. I think I, uh, you know, inspired some other comic creators that are pretty popular on there now to actually run their stuff on, uh, 
webtoon. And good. But I was confused because if you saw the artwork that they were judging, I was like, they just don't like me. <laughs> this lady or this this community manager in particular was really judging me to the point where I actually took some screenshots of um, some other comics that were really like sexualized. I mean, there was some weird stuff happening in these comics. And I was like, hey, yeah, uh, you, you're letting this stuff on your platform, but you're not. I can't have a lady in a like a sports bra. That's basically what she was wearing was a purple sports bra. Yeah. So I don't like censorship. And um, I'm sure it was nothing, but it sure felt personal. You know, it just felt like, wow, oh, you don't want my American comic on your platform. I get it. Even after they said that's what they were trying to do, then they hired a guy, Tom A. Cole. He tried to bring a lot of comic people, but Webtoon never really. Um... What can I say about Webtoon? Webtoon never was it. Webtoon is its own thing. And they tried really hard to get into comic books, but it never really. Uh... Okay, so here I go. I'm going to isolate this layer, isolate these layers so you can't draw outside the lines. Yeah. Um, they hired him. He brought in a bunch of people. They never really connected like they thought they would. They even had Stan Lee for a hot minute uh, with some projects there. And the announcements. They announced like Warren Ellis and a bunch of big comic names that they were going to pay to have on there. And it just something didn't drive. The comic readers don't want that. Webtoon is its own thing. And you can tell people to be excited um, oh yeah, yeah. Now, so yeah, Rich Kempter says Mother Earth was discreetly nude, but someone got offended. It is true that Mother Earth was a completely nude character. However, there were like shadows and hairs. But that the funny thing about that is, is that that was not the comics that got taken down. It was the picture of the girl in the midriff. And then and then they hit the mother load. They're like, whoa, 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 whoa. Anytime this guy's drawing a sexy uh, shaped female or anything, uh, cancel. So uh, that, that was that, that was a bummer. But I feel like my opinion on Webtoon is, is it's good. I wish I didn't have that experience. Wish they could have helped me with understand more. Um, <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> really funny. I even had a nude character that was discreetly covered up and wasn't sexual at all. And it was like, they, they didn't flag that, but they, weird, so weird. So here again, I'm going to work on the um, the coloring. I'm using my watercolor brush for Procreate. Some set of brushes that I, I made these ones myself. And I just, I pretty much, now that I realized yesterday, I use these brushes for almost everything. The color brush, I use for a lot. Yeah. Other people are having, by the way, I don't want to, I'm not pooping on Webtoon. That's my experience, and I'm confused by it. Other people like Steve Conley are having a great time on there, and I say look him up because he's got a lot of good information about that. And who knows, maybe I'll maybe I'll try something again there, but I don't really feel like my audience is there. Just a guess. How long ago was this? This was um, last fall, maybe last July, something like that. If you go on there and you look at Secret Forces, if you search Secret Forces on the Webtoon app, you'll find. You'll find me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have a space nebula, space cloud brush, but I don't know what's going to do. Uh, 
No, I have a nebula brush here too, somewhere. Nebula. That's it. That's the nebula brush. Is it white? Is it white? No, that doesn't look good. Oh. oh, that's neat. Okay, I like that. I'll go to black. I think this brush is set so no matter how what I what I do, it's gonna keep lightening the page. But that looks pretty decent. And I see something that I did not do on this isolation layer, so I'm gonna just tuck this in. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Okay, okay, re-isolate that. I have a star brush here too. Change that to weight. And we'll just hit this up with some stars. And, oh. Well. I want stars in front of this too, so I'm going to hit that. Okay. Those are hard to see on the computer, but I'm putting some stars in there. Yeah, that was yesterday almost. <laughs> and there are a lot of crazy things on Webtoon, that's for sure. Which is why it felt odd. It just felt like my stuff was being singled out and I didn't like that. Because honestly, I don't know. My stuff's kind of like fun and basic. Let's see here. Go choose a damp brush. No, I'm going to stick with my This watercolor brush is what I use probably primarily most of the time. No, wrong layer. Where are we at here? So Rich was watching yesterday when I did some of the, the coloring effects I'm about to do on this page where I don't really care. I'm not trying to make a real photographic planet. I'm trying to just be subtle about what the eye would see from a distance. Like we know that that's looking like earth from a distance. And then I'll go in and actually do this color layer color trick I just isolate the line the line art and then I'll pick like a lighter color and now it's only going to color over the it's going to color those lines in white or whatever or lighten them up a bit maybe I even go like dark green. No. Go lighter green. That looks 
looks like. Yeah, that's fine. Move with that. Just a little bit of that, a little bit of like a different color blue. There's no new rules. No rules really. Kind of like Bob Ross in it, but I like that green. Whoops. Accidentally changed to my Aquamarine, just to, I'm just curious to see what this is now. I don't like that. I don't want that to be a black line, though. I want it to be kind of like a faded out a little bit. Maybe even blue. That's good. Mm -hmm. Leslie, what are your comics? Or if you're still there, what are you uh, what are you working on? Are you thinking about doing webtoon or just drop it in the chat? Or if you have any links to your work or anything like that, drop it in there. that okay cool i'm just gonna do background since i'm already doing some sky stuff we'll skip down to the other one down there so again just gonna keep my um my color brush set to my watercolor brush I'll just go in there and do that and then give me some of this blue. This is the Bob Ross. Uh, this is the Bob Ross uh, section of this uh, stream where I'm like, there's no rules. And can just let the brushes do what they're supposed to do. And there's no real mistakes because if, if you do go over a line and tuck it back in, and it's kind of fun. Or I just go real low and just kind of give a nice little highlight of the atmosphere, the earth. That's cool. Yeah, Webtoon's a good place to start. And if you're just starting out too, you know, like it's okay to be to work on some character designs and amp yourself up watching videos like this or don't spend too much time doing it though. Spend spend some time to actually uh, get to work. Oh, I like that. What's happened in there? Look at that. I like those hues coming together. That's cool. Yeah. 
there's all kinds of cool exercises that you can do. Um, shapes, forms, silhouettes. So that's a big, a lot of character designers I know, or even things that I've read will say, you know, if you can <clears throat> tell the story with a silhouette. So if your figures don't have a good silhouette, like if I were to black out all these people, you would still know that that girl's hand is on her hip. That the body language is still there. It's a good trick to just scribbling and working on some things. Make it a little bit bigger here. Can use the the clouds to be kind of the perspective lines of this globe that's underneath them, right? So it would get bigger down here. Fade off into the it's pretty cool. It's almost like I know what I'm doing. I'm just kind of fooling around. No. Um let's see here. Get this kind of and of course this is a comic book. So <laughs> if we were really looking at Earth from outer space and it was dark, you know, this might actually be a different scene of some kind, like we might show um, black with some orange lights and dots and white, you know, white dots and things, if that makes sense. You don't have to draw every little thing, that's what I'm saying. And I'm not the best. I'm not the best colorist either. I don't really think, but I think learning a little bit, like I said, uh, in the other stream is learning all these steps. Even if you don't do them perfectly, as long as you know that, Hey, that's the earth down there. You know, I'm going to give it a little bit more. It's too light. The screen is too light. So I'm going to, I want it to be a little dark. You know, just to, underneath that ship, just to kind of make it stand out. Or even like, Too dark, too dark, too dark. Then I'll do the same thing too with those harsh lines there. I'll blend those out on that layer. What are we using up here? Grab this green. So when I say it's a comic book, it's like, okay, you know, this is a, this does not have to be um, the Sistine Chapel. We want the reader to know what's happening in the style that I'm doing. So my style is really animated and um, yeah, that's the best way I can describe it, cartoony, animated. And I don't mind it if it's, as long as you or the reader, the viewer goes, 
oh, they're flying above the earth and it's looking pretty decent. If you, um, then I've done my job, really. There's no need to have like too much overthinking going on. Some of my favorite comics when I look back now and I go, oh man, like I thought in my mind that that was like a really detailed planet Earth or something. And as it turned out, you know, it, it wasn't. It was just shapes and um, forms. And that's what we're doing here. Go back in there, get some of the black. I want this to be a deeper blue. That's what I want. Then when you start thinking like this is a cartoonist, Mm, how do I say it's easy to look at the world around you and go, how would I draw that and simplify that down to the shape and color and form and stuff like that. That's fun to think about. I was once zoning out. You got to watch not to zone out though. <laughs> so I was zoning out once um, on an early date with my now wife and, we were at this bar and um, I must have looked like I was a thousand yards there, whatever they call it. Like I was zoning out. And she goes, where are you right now? What are you doing? And I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. When you're dating an artist or someone like me, I'm not thinking anything deep. I promise you I'm not upset or worried or anything like that. It's like, she goes, well, what, what exactly were you thinking just now? Right. So I tell her, okay, do you really want to know? Well, I was looking over there at that case full of beer. There was like a, a restaurant called the head keeper uh, in town. And they have like imported beers and their glass beer wall is, famous for like all the imported beers and like all of the colors and the lighting and they have like a backlighting on it. And it's really pretty to look at. People like to just go in there and just like look at all the beers and look at all the alcohol in there. And I was zoning out staring at that wall of beer and wall of bottles because the bottles were different colors and shapes and I'm at a distance, right? So I'm really far away. And I told her, I said, what I'm thinking in my mind is how would I draw this if a, if a writer gave this to me in a script? What would I do? Like, what, what trick would I use to color all those bottles and that lighting? Like, just like I'm thinking about this, this horizon line light up. You know, it looks kind of neon, but it's not. It's just layers. Um And that's what I'm usually thinking about <laughs> when I'm out. I try not to do it because you don't want to be like, if you're in a relationship, you don't want to be like a weirdo. Be like, I'm in outer space right now. But really, that's a it's one of the good fun things about being a comic creator and a cartoonist is you can entertain yourself wherever you are, really. Um, oh, wait, you got to do the starship now. Okay. All right. About three hours, 14 minutes in this stream so far. And looking pretty good. Cool. Cool, cool. That's good. All right, okay. I'm happy with that. I think I need to color this, this space station before I color the interior of the space station, so... And I think it's going to be like a metallic blue. That's a good base color. Make sure I'm on the right layer. I'm going to go with this base color. And uh, let's just go ahead and let's just go ahead and fill in the, the rest of these these guys with this color too, because we'll just make it a base for all of our outer space stuff. Um,
Okay. Now I switch from like, I like that background painting mode. But what I like to do is I like to switch to a more, the, the, the three tone, two tone animated looking shading. So now I'm just going to go in and select that, give myself one darker tone down. So now I got my second like shade tone for this um, space station. All right, so I'm just going to, yeah, let's just go and color all that in. You know, this side is going to be, um, yeah, I don't need to really think about it too much. I'm just going to put the highlights in there in a minute. We know that this is shaded because I already denoted to this. I noted this by putting that black there. Uh, even this over here is a little bit. So I'm starting to give it some form, right? And now I'm going to go with a little bit of a brighter thing, like a highlight. Uh, that's too much. Oh. Sometimes just that little highlight on the the edge or using that highlight color as the, uh, let's just do that for a second. Let's just do that. Fill that in there. I like that. Take that darker sh shade from down here and throw that into this section. All right, same thing here. And I might go one tone brighter for like like a highlight. Probably kind of hard to see, but it's in there, right? I'll zoom in way in there. Okay, so from a distance, it's looking pretty good. Now it's looking like a real animated type of ship. Now that I got the brighter color, I'll probably just go in and let's hit these windows with some like highlights right and again the story i just said about those bottles and like looking at the lighting and stuff and realizing well a lot of it's just circles and shapes and bright flashes and things going off so something that's up close just looking like that you know from a distance it looks like there's some stuff happening there there's some some sort of Space station windows. Right. It's trickery. Okay. And I got the I have an, an, an extra tone of dark. Of this tone here that I'm just going to throw in, but I keep the window. So there's a line of windows here, and that bright highlight should like pop it off a little bit on those windows, right? Yeah. Then I think for some reason I just kind of want to make these windows green. Don't know why. Just looks pretty cool, like a command center of some kind. All right. Okay, my 
wife's home. One second. Alrighty, so yeah, Rich Kepter says the boss is back. Uh, I made a, I made a uh, agreement with my wife today. Not an agreement. It wasn't like a contract. <laughs> I said, yeah, I'll go with you to the farmers market at two o'clock. So she's home now. She's allowed to pull me out of the zone. She's one of the only people that's allowed. Um. But pretty good. Three hours, 22 minute stream today. Got a little bit more to color on this page, you know. And if you want to see maybe how these spaceships are going to turn out, I think that's a good Instagrammable uh, post. So follow me on Instagram and, or uh, we'll take a look <clears throat> in the next stream. So make sure that you're subscribed and all that. Point this camera at myself. And say goodbye. Let's see here. Nope. Okay, okay. There we go. Awesome. Still sunny outside. It's cold though. My wife says it's cold. Sunny outside. Thanks for watching today. Um, gonna go pick up some vegetables and some stuff for the Easter holiday. So um yeah, thanks for uh, watching today, and I hope that you, um, I hope it, it was entertaining. So thanks, Leslie. Tune in next time for more uh, deep, deep thoughts and deep work for me. We'll see you guys. Oh, now I'll see you guys. All right, bye.